This is the National Broadcasting Company. Hey everyone, I'm Simone, and tonight on Signal, Amazon scraps its plans for a New York HQ2. And Richard Branson could soon be sending tourists into outer space. He tells us about one politician he'd like to send there too. And it's Valentine's Day. We'll tell you what happens in your brain when you're falling in love. But first, we've been watching all day to see if President Trump would sign the bipartisan spending package and avoid another government shutdown. Now we have an answer, we think. After getting assurance from Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell that Trump would sign the deal, the Senate passed it by a huge margin, 83 to 16. The House is expected to vote tonight, and the president is expected to sign the bill. But because it doesn't include all the money he wanted for a border wall, he's also planning to declare a national emergency to get that money, meaning he'll use funding from different parts of the federal government, most notably the Department of Defense. Speaker Pelosi was asked about how the Demo Democrats plan to respond if he goes through with it. We'll review our options, but it's important to note that when the president declares this emergency, first of all, it's not an emergency, what's happening at the border. It's a humanitarian challenge to us. The president has tried to sell a bill of goods to America, but putting that aside, just in terms of uh, the president making an end run around Congress, here he said, let us respect what the committee will do, and then he walks away from it. All right, NBC's Cal Perry is on the border looking at the state of the wall right now. Hey, Simone, we're just outside of Brownsville in South Texas, and as you can see behind me, everything is bigger, including the wall. But as we talk about this appropriations bill, check this out. There are giant holes in this wall. As you go the 1,200 miles that Texas shares a border with Mexico, giant holes in the wall, and that's again because of appropriations. The U.S. government does not move very quickly on anything. They appropriate things, and then years later, the funding actually comes through. Two reasons for the giant hole in this wall. One is funding. This wall and pieces of it went in in 2008. This is supposed to be a gate. The second problem, besides funding drying up, was that you have all these private property owners on the other side of this wall, and they have to have access to their property. You also hear a lot about technology, right? The wall and technology, it's those two things together. Check out those motion sensors on that wall. The U.S. government and Customs and Border Protection say they need more of that, that it's a combination of the wall and the technology. So again, while the president is signing this appropriations bill today and everybody can take a sigh of relief about the government not shutting down, the bigger issue, border security, is still an unsolved issue because again, this appropriations and the lag in the funding and the negotiations with churches and sanctioned sanctuaries and private owners, it's gonna go on for a long, long time, for years to come in both the court systems and in negotiations. So these giant gaps in these walls, get used to them because they're here to stay. All right, thanks so much, Cal. Julia Ainsley is in Washington to break down how this might all play out. Okay, Julia, so what has the reaction been like after Trump has decided he's going to sign that funding bill as well as declare a national emergency? Is this something folks in Washington saw coming? So it's funny, Simone, that's something we'd heard rumors about, and McConnell wanted to get the signal before he brought this bill to the floor. So he gets off of the phone with the president, goes to the floor, and is basically his messenger for this news that not a lot of people want. We're already hearing people on the Democrat side start to prepare lawsuits. Is the expectation here that this emergency funding that he wants to divert to the wall is just going to get tied up in court? Yeah, I think that is a big expectation. But it seems that it could be a win-win for the president because he keeps us talking about the wall as this thing plays out. He can sign the bit of funding that he got, but he doesn't get in trouble with these conservative commentators. Now, people have spoken to say that those people really get under his skin. And this way, he will get the funding and keep the government open. But I do think that anyone who's trying to read a crystal ball, we'll see that this does get tied up. Let's talk a little bit more about where this emergency funding for the wall is going to come from. So we may get more details tomorrow, but the thing that I've heard is it will come from several pots, and the main one will be defense funding, funding that's already set aside for construction. The one thing that we think has been taken off the table, and we'll see, again, things can change really rapidly in this administration, is using funds that were set aside for disaster relief. What happens next? When do we see, you know, the next step in this process. It's kind of funny in a way that the messaging came so kind of 
distant from the president today. It came from McConnell on the floor, but Trump will have to own this and he may want to own this. So we'll hear his speech where he tries to make his argument for this. As far as pushback, I mean, let the lawsuits begin. I think Democrats on the Hill are already gearing up for how they'll push back on this. Julia, thank you so much. Thanks, Simone. So it sounds like the government is going to pass a spending bill after all, but some of the things that have been defunded in recent years include efforts to fight extremism. NBC New York's Alexa Liotto spent the day with a former jihadist who's trying to fill the void. I told him I'm a former jihadist. I'd really like to just talk to you to get to know your views. De-radicalization is a serious process. It is not an event. You don't wake up one morning and say, I don't want to be a white nationalist anymore. Homegrown extremism has been on the rise for the past decade. And one group has become the most deadly, far right-wing extremists. Since 9-11, they've been responsible for 73% of deaths in violent extremist cases. 12 people who have been shot. Reported gunmen on the loose. Horrifying scene in Charlottesville. The Anti-Defamation League counted 50 extremist-related murders in 2018 and said, every single extremist killing from Pittsburgh to Parkland had a link to right-wing extremism. But in 2017, the Trump administration stripped funding from key groups, helping right-wing extremists leave their movements. Instead, money was redirected towards things like law enforcement. So if homegrown extremism is a major issue, but fewer programs now exist to fight it, is anyone stepping in? This is Jesse Morton. He's a former al-Qaeda recruiter who was sentenced to more than 11 years in prison for operating a radical Islamic website that made violent threats. Hey, Jesse. Now, he's on a mission to help members of radical organizations step away, ideally before they commit violence. I met up with him en route to one of his current projects. I'm not a bad person, and I don't want to be mean to other people. Whether that's a white person, a black person, a Jewish person, it doesn't matter to me. Okay, let's back up. That's Jason Kessler. He was involved in organizing that. You will not replace us! One of the most hate-filled rallies of our generation, which happened in Charlottesville two summers ago. I'm forever going to be the symbol of, like, David Duke 2.0. We're meeting at Jesse's apartment in a location outside of Washington, D.C. It's where he runs his small nonprofit, Parallel Networks. Jesse and Jason have been talking for months. What do you hope to accomplish from your conversation with Jason today? We're here for him to help him facilitate his exit in the event that he wants to do so. We are under no delusions about the fact that that might not work out well. Jason has indications that he could go either way, but if he doesn't have support, if he doesn't have an alternative network to get embedded in, he's not going to make that transition. The Charlottesville Police Department told me that Jason was never arrested on charges related to the rally itself, but he is involved in a number of civil lawsuits tied to that day. I think most people might identify this type of work to be typically conducted by law enforcement rather than under the bucket of social work. How do you think about that? Well, there would be no way to do an interdiction on Jason with regard to law enforcement because he hasn't broken the law. Hey. Hey, how are you? Good. They go on to have a lengthy conversation. It's full of twists and turns. It gets political. I am not going to back dialogue that allows racially motivated activism, a white civil rights well, platform. So, so do you have a problem with uh, Black Lives Matter? Do you think Black Lives Matter should be dismantled because that's racial advocacy? And at times, personal too. I've been in your shoes. I've been in your shoes. And at the end of the day, when I had time to actually exit, take a breath, and stop, I came out and I realized it was my traumas manifested outside of myself. Jason says he's ready to de-radicalize, but it's clear that doesn't happen overnight. I, I do believe in what I'm saying, and it's the only reason that I put up with as much as I have so far. If white people aren't allowed to talk about the issues that concern them... I cannot accept the idea that white people are not allowed to express their views, because it's not true. I don't think that the Unite the Right rally was part of the solution. I do think that it exacerbated and made things worse. This has been a very messy struggle for me to understand the racial landscape. Do you think you've changed since the 2017 rally in Charlottesville? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think that I have my own um, 
emotional issues as a human being that have exacerbated my problems, you know, like uh, seeing people attack me and then I feel like I have to attack back and it just creates this cycle of negativity and anger and hate. You don't identify as a white supremacist? Definitely not, no. Neo-Nazi? No. Alt-right? No. What do you identify yourself as? <sighs> I'm just a person. I consider myself a civil rights advocate. But when you are one of the organizers that brings together the largest gathering of white supremacists in a generation, mm -hmm. can you see how people make those assumptions? I promoted something which is not good for America. I gave a platform to some very bad people, and I realize that now. After digesting the conversation between Jesse and Jason, I called up Mitch Silber the former director of intelligence for the NYPD. His team actually used to track Jesse when he was active. But now, the two of them work together. How do you distinguish between someone who is an extremist or someone who's just angry about stuff and is talking about stuff online? It's very difficult to be able to discern who will make that turn to violence and who's just venting. With Kessler, I don't think he's going to carry out a violent act, but things that he says, things that he's um, talked about, you know, might instigate, motivate, mobilize someone to cross the line into violence. Government funding or not, Jesse vows to keep talking to Jason, if anything, to make sure that he's never involved in something like Charlottesville ever again. Okay, Richard Branson, he's done land and space, so now he's doing sea. The CEO of Virgin Galactic is starting a cruise line. Virgin Voyages will start sailing in 2020, and tickets for the inaugural cruises are already on sale right now. So this one is adult only, and it features access to one of Branson's private beaches. That could be a cool perk, but we did get a bit orbital when I asked Branson about which politician he'd most like to send to space. What is it going to be like on a Virgin Voyage? Fun. Um, I think that you know, cru cruise ships are not, by and large, fun. They're, they're very stuffy. You have massive big buffets. You have enormous queues. I've never been interested in going on a cruise ship, but I thought if we could create the kind of cruise ship that myself and my friends would love to go on, uh, it could be a success. So, you know, instead of buffets, we've got 35 individual little restaurants, uh, uh, yeah, got, yeah. You, you know, beautiful dance floors and the discos. And no children, right? This is adult Yeah, we, we created something. We listened to our sailors. And even we talked to moms and dads. They needed a break from the kids as well. So we have a pol policy. Uh, it's adult by design, no children under 18. You know what? That allows you, us to do things that others can't. You know, we don't have the screaming kids in the pool. We don't have the teenagers running up and down the hallway. So you can provide a much more sophisticated experience. Now, you mentioned you wanted to create a cruise line that you and your friends would want to go on. Are we talking about friends like, I don't know, Barack Obama? Are we going to Are we gonna maybe <laughs> see him on a virgin They're, voyage? Well, you never know. I've got a horribly big birthday coming up and I'm going to be inviting a lot of, uh, a lot of people I've known throughout my life and, and uh, there'll be some fun people on board. Now, you said you have a big birthday coming up. Any chance you're celebrating by going to space? <laughs> Uh, well, the next birthday um, uh, in July, I, I'm hoping to be able to go to space. I'd love to be able to coincide it with the moon landing and go to space. Um, so I've got the whip on the team and we'll, we'll, we'll see how we go. So you two have worked together for several years now. Would you describe him as a competitive person? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, are you kidding me? The most successful entrepreneurs of all time. That competitive spirit that you have, Richard, uh, is that what drives the billion dollar space race? How competitive is it between you, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos? Is it competitive at all? Um, I'm sure there's a little bit of competition, but actually it's taken us both 14 years to um, build our space lines. Um, you know, create, creating a spaceship that can send people safely into space time and time and time again is, is, the real, is the real competition. Something that I think is so interesting that an executive from your company, Virgin Galactic, brought up is the idea of overview, being able to yeah. see Earth from outer space and how that changes your perspective. If you could send one politician to space <laughs> to allow them to have that overview, a different perspective on Earth, who would it be? Well, I think any, any politician who seems to be a bit divisive and, and um, you know, I mean, obviously Trump, can, he's got a divisive side to him. You don't need the divisive rhetoric. Everybody just needs to get on. What's your reaction to Howard Schultz running for president? I do think that um, having the right kind of businessman in the White House makes sense. I mean, somebody like Mike Bloomberg, I think, would be 
very good in the White House. Maybe Hal Schultz would be good as well. You need, um, I think, a business leader that knows, you know, is a really good businessman, um, but also somebody who's not a divisive personality. He wants to rebrand the term billionaire. He says billionaires are getting a bad rap and they should be called people of means. Do you think there's something to that? I think that billionaires have a massive responsibility to get out there and, you know, solve blindness in Africa, um, you know, sort out climate change and other things. What we need is billionaires who, who are spending that money, not letting that money sit in their bank accounts and um, sorting out the problems of the world. I know you mentioned that you would be a fan of heavier taxes for the wealthy. Do you think that's one of the solutions? Yes, as long as the government <laughs> use it wisely. Um, I mean, I think my, my absolute preference would be that the people who are wealthy um, make sure that they use that money to um, sort, sort out big issues in the world. Well, humanity is counting on you to get us to space and find us a new home, so no pressure, okay? Uh, thank you, <laughs> and we look forward to having you out there one day. Did Richard Branson just invite me to space? Uh, pretty cool. Okay, now here are some of today's headlines briefly. Amazon is ditching its plans to build headquarters in New York. They say it's because of local politicians who oppose the plan and wouldn't play ball. Some, like Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, were against the development and the huge tax subsidies offered to Amazon. Here's how she reacted to the announcement. I think it's incredible. I mean, it shows that everyday Americans still have the power to organize and fight for their communities and they can have more say in this country than the richest man in the world. Well, this was also a setback for New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, who also said in a statement that he was disappointed. He says a small group of politicians put their own narrow political interests above their community, and the New York State Senate should be held accountable for this, quote, lost economic opportunity. All right, moving on, the Senate confirmed William Barr to be the new attorney general. The vote breakdown was 54-45, with three Democrats voting in favor and only one Republican voting no. Democrats largely opposed his nomination, saying they want him to commit to releasing special counsel Robert Mueller's final report in full. Barr says he'll release as much as he can under the law. Barr, who had the job once before under George Bush Sr., was sworn in at the White House earlier today by Chief Justice John Roberts. And a lot of people are going to have a new online dating story to share after today. The dating app Coffee Meets Bagel notified current and past users that data from their accounts may have been, quote, acquired by an unauthorized party. The data includes names and email addresses that user had, users had shared with the app. A company spokeswoman said about 6 million users were affected by the breach. And those are your headlines briefly. We'll be back in 30 seconds. We are going to start with something different tonight. This is one of those things that you have not been otherwise hearing about in the news, but stick with me. Feed your mind with fresh perspective. Get your favorite MSNBC shows now as podcasts. The topics we cover on MSNBC every day, they're driven by big ideas, big themes, huge societal changes. And that's what we talk about on our new podcast. It's called Why Is This Happening? Why Is This Happening with Chris Hayes? New episodes every Tuesday. A year ago today, a gunman killed 14 students and three staff members at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. And this morning at 1017, thousands of students and adults across the state held a moment of silence to honor the victims. The decision to hold it at that time was made in honor of the 17 victims. The Today Show's digital team sat down with one of the students who survived that deadly day. It honestly just sounded like extremely loud pops. Oh my God. I knew it was something out of the ordinary, so we all paused and like it was immediate eye contact with everybody in the classroom and we just froze. I'm Malaya Eastman, I'm 17 and a survivor of the February 14th shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. So if you're just joining us here, this is a, an active shooter situation at Stoneman Douglas High School. I didn't even know it was real as he was shooting into the classroom, but I looked up and I saw my classmate slumped over on the wall, and immediately after seeing her, Nicholas Dorrett was sitting in front of me, and he fell over. And when he fell over, 
I instantly just moved with every movement of his body and then went underneath him and laid there. And then at that point, I was just talking to God because I knew I was going to die. I was just saying, just make it quick. I don't want to feel anything. Eventually, after I'd say 25 seconds, he moved on to the next classrooms. So I called my mom. I don't know how long we were on the phone, but I remember calling her and saying how much I love her. I'm sorry for all the bad things I've done, but I love you and I'm just saying goodbye. I was just home cooking for when Alea come home and um, she called and at me hearing shots in the background at, a, at her school. She's saying, classmate is dead. I just couldn't understand, like I, I couldn't understand knowing that she said that she's gonna die, I believed her. I truly believe that the cops was gonna come at my house and say, Miss Llewellyn, I'm sorry to tell you that your daughter has passed. Eventually, the cops came in and I remember walking out and passing all the smoke and bullet shells and there was two more bodies in the hallway on our way out. They took my statement, and my phone was at 1%. And I remember getting the notification from the news saying, 17 dead, numbers to rise at Stillman Douglas. February 14th is something that's gonna have to stay with me forever. Every little thing, I can relate back to February 14th. I've always had that in the back of my mind that it happens in communities of color every day. Hi, my name is Alea Eastman, a junior at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to share my experience and perspectives on gun violence in America. So for it to happen to me, you know, in my face, that just shows that, you know, change has to happen now. This year has just been really, really weird. You know, I've had life-changing experiences that were so positive and amazing, but it came from this terrible, terrible event. It's so hard trying to understand everything, but I'm just so grateful that I am alive, and I, I know that I have to speak for those that no longer can and that were senselessly taken away from us and we just can't forget about those and hopefully work to prevent more people from losing their lives. What a strong young woman. All right, taking a hard left turn here, but what the world needs more of is love, and we couldn't let our Valentine's Day show end without a little of that. So I don't want to ruin the romance on this day of love for you guys, but falling in love, the daydreaming, the heart palpitations, the obsessive thoughts, it's all just science. Here's a virtual look at your brain on love. Falling for someone can be a roller coaster of emotions. You might feel everything from giddiness and exhilaration to anxiety and loss of appetite. A 2005 study analyzed the brains of people falling in love. With just a look at their romantic interests, reward centers lit up the MRI. So, here's what happens. First, dopamine, the feel-good hormone, is released. It's the same chemical that causes us to feel pleasure when we eat our favorite foods, get a high from drugs, or go for a long run. And yes, sex. Yes! Oh! 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 Oh, God! Oh! I'll have what she's having. The euphoria created can be too much for the body, so the brain reacts by sending out a stress hormone. But when cortisol increases, it forces a drop in serotonin. That whole obsessive can't eat, can't sleep, laughing one minute, crying the next thing, that's all serotonin. And this is where infatuation comes in. What group is she in? They don't even think about a group. Bianca Stratford, she's a soft. I burn, I pine, I perish. Of course you do. So Beyonce wasn't wrong when she made Crazy in Love. The madness does eventually subside, though, and other, more stable feelings take over. The relationship goes from this... Still is it over. 
to this. Do you think our love could take us away together? Despite the wild ride, love is just good for you. Some studies say it can even lengthen your life. And if this is all true, we should all love a little more. It can't hurt. Well, that's our show for tonight. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.